guys all right so uh today i i, I titled this uh this live stream dancing with the ministry of death it's a little bit of a whimsical title but uh, you know have you have you heard that have you heard ministry of death you know that's that's something i think that uh, a lot of a lot of new covenant teachers will say they'll refer to the law of moses and they'll say it's the ministry of death it's the ministry of death and condemnation How, however they phrase that but ministry of death usually takes center stage uh, so I guess like where does that come from? I mean, is that is that something Scripture says? Is that you know wh why are we calling it that? And yes, it actually is. It's in it's in Scripture. It's in Second uh, Corinthians uh, in in particular. And I thought it would be cool if we just went through that little bit of Scripture and kind of discussed it back and forth and really kind of like flesh out, I guess, a little bit why why the law is referred to by Paul as a ministry of death and condemnation. Uh, good morning up north. Uh, good morning by Grace New Covenant. So I thought I thought we would start with 2 Corinthians chapter 3, kind of like we did uh, last, last week with Romans, and just kind of move through some of this together and discuss it back and forth as we go. So at, at the very beginning here, I'm going to move my coffee before I... I always mean to do that before I start the camera because one of these days I'm gonna I'm gonna backhand it if I don't move it. The, ha the hands move too much when I talk. So, uh, starting up here at the beginning, so chapter three, Paul opens by saying, "Are we beginning to commend ourselves again?" Uh, commend is not a word that we use a ton in our everyday language. So, just in case anyone listening uh, isn't familiar with that, it's a lot like a recommendation. Um, but it's it's more or less like if you were like going to look for a job or whatever, and I happen to know the person who was hiring, and I went to them and said, hey, this is the person you want, and let me tell you why, that that could be referred to as commending. You're commending that person. Really, we just use recommending, which is an easier word, I think. But that, it's, it's all in the same breath, commend and recommend. It's, it's the same kind of thing. So Paul's saying, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Are we beginning to recommend ourselves? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you. You yourselves are a letter written on our heart, known and read by everyone. So the context here, what's going on, uh, this is 2 Corinthians. So we remember what happened in 1 Corinthians, where Paul sent this absolutely heated letter where he is just smacking this church left and right um, about all these different things that they're doing. Well, the letter wasn't well received, and that's why 2 Corinthians opens with an apology for that letter. He's like, I, I wrote to you harshly. I know I hurt some of you. Um, I, you know, he, he's, he's, he's acknowledging it, and he's, he's saying, look, look I, I had to do this. Um, this stuff was really serious. But now there's some in the Corinthian church that are really not wanting Paul at all involved with the church anymore. And I think 1 Corinthians probably had a lot to do with that. So they've elected new apostles. They, they call them the super apostles that they've elected. And they say the super apostles, now that's a real special apostle. And that's somewhere up here. And now Paul, you know, yeah, okay, you know, thanks for your help, Paul. Get out of here now. So, so they're they're now turning to Paul and they're saying, okay, where's your qualifications? Where, where's yours? Because I, I can look at the super apostles and they're going to tell me exactly why why they're qualified to to teach and do all these things. So, Paul, where, where's your where's your resume? I, I think we need to review that. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, do I need a letter of recommendation? Um, and then he's saying, you yourselves are my letter of recommendation, meaning, hey, I was instrumental in founding this church. He says that in 1 Corinthians. He says, I planted um, Apollos watered, but God's been making it grow. Uh, he, he's the church planner here. And they're, and they're asking him for his credentials. So, so, I mean, the audacity, he's offended when he's writing this. He's like, you, you are my credentials, known and read by everyone. And he says in verse 3, you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. You, Corinthian church, are the result of our ministry. You exist because of our ministry. He's, he's saying that. He's like, we preach the gospel to you. You believe the gospel. The reason you have a church here is because of us. And it's not it's not an arrogant thing. It's not like, you know, he's, he's, he's boasting in that. He's saying that, you know, you're, you're now you're saying you don't want to, you know, you're not taking me seriously anymore because you have the super apostles and all this stuff going on here. Um, I think it's important to remember how we began, you know, how we, how we all began together here. So, um, but there's a contrast and this is where he's going to start going into the, to the old covenant versus the new covenant. Um, right here, he says, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. He's speaking about the law with that. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. Uh, not with ink, but with the spirit of God. So a couple things that are, that are um, t I think, takeaways from, from the law when we hear those, those parallels. 
the first Ten Commandments, as we know, were written and engraved on stone. They're written and engraved on stone tablets, first by God, and then by second, I believe, by Moses. I believe Moses actually engraved the second set. I don't think God did. I'll have to reread that. I know he, he certainly did the first one. It was written by the finger of God, but I think the second one was actually written by Moses. But regardless, the first Ten Commandments were written on tablets of stone. The rest of the law was written on parchment or whatever they had that they were writing on animal skin. Who knows what it was? Um, they wrote the rest of the law on that. But it is also very important to um, to know this because th the fact that the Ten Commandments were written in stone gets there's theologies that get built on that. And they say this is the moral law, this is the eternal law, which is why it was written in stone. We we use that expression, don't we? Uh, just in our everyday life. Well, it's not written in stone. It's not like it's written in stone. Nothing's written in stone. You know, we, we use that expression. And doctrines get built on the fact that the Ten Commandments were written in stone. And they say those are eternal, they're for everyone, and they're forever. Here is the inconvenient problem with that. And something that's that really is not well known, but but needs to be kind of on the ready in case someone brings that to, to us. Um, the entire law was written in stone. So when, they, when, the, when the Israelites cross the Jordan River, they do this strange ceremony of sorts that's actually prescribed in the book of Deuteronomy, but in the book of Joshua, they act it out. And there's two mountains that are kind of parallel to each other. And one is Mount Ebal and the other is Mount Gerizim. And what you have is the Israelites on the Mount on Mount Ebal, you have some people go there. I think they divide into two groups. So this is probably everybody. So you have half the Israelites go to Mount Ebal and they stand on top of Mount Ebal. And then you have the other half go to Mount Gerizim. Okay? So you have this this strange thing happening when, when they get over there. All right. So they're standing on these mountains. I don't know, they're staring at each other, whatever. But Mount Ebal, they actually write out the entire law on stone on Mount Ebal. Every, every bit of it. All 613 commandments are etched into stone and they're set up on Mount Ebal. Then the people on Mount Ebal read off every single curse that is written in the book of Deuteronomy. So Mount Ebal is the place of curses. It's the, it's the mountain of curses. So Mount Gerizim, the people also read off every blessing that's written in Deuteronomy. Oh, if we, you know, if we keep this law, then this will happen. This will happen. All the things that really never happened um, because they never kept the law. So you have Ebal and you have Gerizim, curse and, um, and blessing. Now, the blessings never came through the law. They never did. The law was a complete disaster. They, they fell short, and eventually um, Israel and Judah were wiped clean from the map. And that's what Deuteronomy said was going to happen. That's what the curses on Mount Ebal said. Uh, the takeaway from that are two things. One, the entire law was written on stone. The entire law is written on stone. So there is no, no doctrines we can build on the fact that the Ten Commandments were written in stone, 613 commandments were written in stone. The whole thing was eternal. Uh, it, was not, it was not just part of it. Uh, the entire thing was etched in stone. So and we can find that in the book of Deuteronomy where it's prescribed, and we can find that in Joshua where it's actually done. The other thing is this, and this is the cool thing. Mount Gerizim was the mountain of blessing, and no blessing ever came from Gerizim, except a blessing did come to Gerizim, because the Mount Gerizim is the very same mountain that Jesus met the woman at the well on, that's on Mount Gerizim, and that's when he announced he was the Messiah. So the blessing did come to Gerizim, but it never came from Gerizim, and it never came from the law. But the mountain of blessing was still a mountain of blessing, because that's where Jesus announced that he is the person. It's, it's him. He's, he's the one that the law was ta talking about. Um, it was, it's, it's all him. That, that's where he made his, his uh, messianic announcement was on Gerizim. So it's, it's cool. It's a, it's a cool connection. But anyway, uh, going back to this, that was just about the law being written in stone. Uh, just, just one of those important things to, to, um, to know, that the entire law was written in stone. So going on here, he in verse 4, he says, Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter is referring to the law. The law kills, but the spirit gives life. We're not ministers of the law, Paul says. We're ministers of the new covenant, which is of the spirit, tablets of human heart, not tablets of stone. He's making a back and forth uh, parallel here. Now he goes down here into verse 7 and he says, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily on the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was. So the ministry that brought death, that's where that phrase comes from, the ministry of death. Uh, 
And that's, that's where, whenever we say that, that's where it's coming from. The law is referred to as a ministry of death, and so it was. Seven of the Ten Commandments are death sentences. Uh, they're capital offenses. Most of the law is a capital offense if you violate it. And if it's not a capital offense, it's some other horrible thing that happens if you, if you violate it. Not to mention all the curses laid out in Deuteronomy that are going to befall upon you if you don't keep the law perfectly. So it is a ministry of death. It is absolutely that. And Paul says that. Now he says, which was engraved in letters on stone. Yes, all the law was engraved in letters on stone. But he says, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily on the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was. Um, transitory though it was means that Moses had a glory that was not his own. He was close to God up on Mount Sinai. He was he's close to God. And he actually ended up absorbing some of God's glory. It, it kind of like stuck on him, if you will. Um, but the... When he moved down from the mountain, he still was shining. He still had some of God's light kind of kind of absorbed into his skin. However that works, we don't really know. But it wasn't Moses' glory, and that's why it was fading. That's why Paul says transitory though it was. It was transitory glory. It was transferred to him, but it didn't last. It faded away because it was never his. And he's going to compare and contrast that with the child of God because our situation is completely different than Moses' was. So he goes down here in verse 8 and he says, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? So the old covenant was glorious. He's saying, look, it came with glory. God himself came down from heaven. He delivered this law. Um, this came with glory, unlike anything the earth had ever seen at that point. But then he says, but won't the ministry of the Spirit come with even more glory than the ministry of death? And then he goes on here um, and he says, If the ministry that brought condemnation, the law, was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness, the new covenant, the ministry of the Spirit. One brings condemnation, that is Moses, the other brings righteousness, that is Christ. So he's comparing them once again. And then he says in verse 10, for what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory, meaning Jesus blew the doors off the law. So you have the law that shows up, and it says, this is really a presentation that's put on. You have God speaking from the mountain. You've got the fire, the smoke, everything, and this is glorious. And I mean, people are wowed. They're amazed. Moses is glowing. Um, th this is just a crazy thing, it's, it's, and it, it's glorious. But then he's saying, um, right here, he's saying that how much more uh, glorious will the, will the um, ministry that brings righteousness be? For what was glorious, the old law, the old covenant, has no glory in comparison with the surpassing glory of the new. So there's no comparison. Jesus is so much greater than, than the law. He is so much greater than, than this ministry Moses had. Uh, in fact, Paul says there's no comparison. It's not, you can't even, you can't even compare them. You can't even take Moses's ministry and say, well, you know, Jesus was kind of like that. It's not kind of like that. His is, it's, his is in space and Moses's is all the way down here. You know, that's that there's there's such a gap between the glory of those ministries. So that's why Paul says there's no comparison. Um, but then he goes on here in verse 11 and he says, And if what was transitory came with glory, old covenant was transitory glory, meaning Moses absorbed God's glory for a short period of time. How much greater is the glory of that which lasts? There's a there's a twofold meaning there. Now, there's a twofold meaning there. So Moses absorbed God's glory. He's actually glowing. So he's like a physical representation of that. Another way I think we could interpret that transitory glory is that the old covenant was fading away from the day it was given. Um, it was a placeholder. Um, the law was the guardian of Israel until the coming of the seed of Abraham, the book of Galatians says. It was only for a short period of time. The Israelites didn't know that. Nobody knew that. Nobody. God is not famous for explaining himself. He, he just is not. Um, that's, that's something that is, is just completely consistent throughout all of scripture. He is not famous for explaining himself, really, until you get to the epistles, when he finally explains the mystery of Christ um, and how this was all, this was all foreshadowed. And, and he kind of wakes everybody up to that, that he's been telling the story of his son the entire time all throughout the Old Testament. But nobody got this. Uh, nobody knew that the Old Covenant was was transitory um, when it showed up, but but it was because this was always just a placeholder. This was always something that was going to be superseded by the coming of the Son of God. Um, since nobody knew that the Son of God was coming, nobody knew that the law was a placeholder. Uh, so so that's 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 another way we could interpret that transitory bit. This was a tra this was a transitory temporary order. Um, Hebrews actually refers to the old covenant as the old order and the new covenant is the new order. Um, saying that the old the old order was in place only until the t coming of the new order. Essentially, it was always going to be replaced. 
So uh, and then going down in verse 12 here, he says, <clears throat> therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We, the children of God, have such a hope that we are very bold. And I love verse 13. We are not like Moses. We are not like Moses. Remember what we talked about yesterday? Be like the Old Testament characters. You should really try to be like the Old Testament characters. Really should try to be like Moses, um, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, especially David. You really ought to try to be like David. I mean, fill in the blank. Um, we are not like them. We are not like them. We are not like Moses. Scripture tells us that. <laughs> Who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. So what we have there is we're not like Moses in the sense that his glory is fading um, because it isn't his. He absorbed the glory of God the Father when he was on the mountain. Um, he, he absorbed that glory, but that was never his. He was never glorified. In his, that, so that's why it was fading away. It wasn't something he actually possessed. It was the glory of another that he had. And um, so, he, but, but, but everyone was scared of it. I mean, honestly... They're scared of Moses anyway. I mean, Moses is, everyone's terrified of Moses anyway. You know, he comes down, they're having that party with the golden calves, and he smashes the tablets and makes them all drink a bunch of contaminated water, which kills half of them. So everybody's probably has a, has not the, you know, warm and fuzzy feelings when they think about Moses anyway. But then he comes down the mountain and he's glowing like a light bulb. So then it's just like, now now what happened? Like, now now what? You know, <laughs> so, what you know, what, what, what fresh hell is this? So, so Moses... Then he puts, he puts a veil over his face so not to frighten everyone. I think they still were frightened. They probably were frightened just by the mere presence of Moses, but maybe the veil helped calm those nerves a smidge. So he, he says that he's like, um, where were we at here? Um, okay, so we're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. The glory of God is passing away from Moses. Moses has left the presence of Yahweh and Yahweh's glory is fading away from him. The end of what was passing away. But then it's going to talk about the state of the Israelites here in verse 14. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. This is powerful scripture. Their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains whenever the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it ever taken away. Uh, my goodness, what do we do with that? You know, when we... When we compare that to our Christian teachings, which do nothing but mix in the Old Covenant and try to try to try to smush all that together and, and cram Christianity back into the into the ministry of death, um, what, what do we do with that? When it's saying that it, it's saying that there, it's, it's it's saying that the Old Covenant there's there's a veil. The veil remains whenever the Old Covenant is read. Only in Christ is the veil ever removed. Um, j just to pause here, I saw um, one of your comments pop up. This is First Corinthians. Uh, I'm sorry. It is 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that we're in right now. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 15 specifically. That's where we're at. Uh, so he says that here, he says, and then he goes on, he says, even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. When Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But when anyone, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So only in Christ is this veil ever removed. So he's using the actual literal veil that Moses put over his face to conceal the glory of God. And now he's saying that that veil now metaphorically hangs over the eyes and the ears of the Israelites now that they can't see the glory of God. They can't see this greater glory of the new covenant. They're stuck in the old. They're stuck. They're stuck. Like, um, and so there's this veil separating them from seeing the, the glory of the new covenant, which is, of course, the Son of God. Um, now he goes on in verse 17 and he says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces, that's us, we're the children of God, we are those with the unveiled faces. Um, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So there's a parallel there. Moses' glory was not his, first of all. It was not his own. Um, and it was fading away. Not the case for the children of God. Not only do we not have a veil over our face, so there's no hiding. You know, there's, you know, there's no hiding. But we possess a glory that's ever increasing. And this is the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Spirit, the glory of the new ministry, the new covenant. And that's, that's what he's comparing and contrasting. He says, look, the old was fading from the moment it was given. It was fading away. The new, not is it, not, not is it just not fading 
it's not even stagnant. It's not even, a, you know, you just have, you. okay, so you're glorified. You know, you have glory. It's not even that. It's the opposite of fading. It's ever increasing. So the glory of the children of God, which we have through Christ, the ministry of the Spirit, because Jesus is literally living within us, inside our hearts, the glory we have is ever increasing because his glory is ever increasing. So what a difference between the ministry of death and the ministry of the Spirit. What, what an amazing difference that we have going on there. These also don't mix. There's no way that we could take the, okay, so now we have the ministry of death and condemnation with the fading glory. Um, we have the ministry of the spirit with the ever increasing glory. The, um, we, have, we have slavery, we have freedom, all the different parallels that are being made here in this chapter. Um, we have a veiled mind, we have an unveiled mind. <laughs> Let's try to make a hybrid creature out of this. Um, it's gonna be a Frankenstein and it's going to be probably honestly worse than what the, the old covenant was. Uh, that's it. They just do not mix. These are two completely different ministries. There's no mixing these. So, uh, so, so that's, that's what we got in chapter three. Um, let's move on here a little bit to chapter four, because chapter four has some really good scripture in it too, speaking again about the situation of the children of God. So going on here, let's just start at the top here. Um, therefore, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, the ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of, of uh, Jesus Christ, the ministry of reconciliation is what he's going to call it here in a second. We do not lose heart, he says. We don't, we don't lose heart because we have this ministry. We have this hope. We have Christ in us. Uh, we, are, we, we are those of the unveiled mind, the ever-increasing glory. Uh, I want to pause there for a second. Glory is something we're generally not comfortable with saying that the children of God, us, we've actually been glorified. Uh, Romans says, those who God justified, he also glorified. Um, we've actually been glorified. Being a child of God is a position of great glory. It's not something that's, you know, okay, so haha, look at us. It's not that. That's never been our heart. We would never think that way. Um, but scripture does tell us that. You know, it, it does tell us that, that we have been glorified. We've been glorified by God with an ever-increasing glory. That will never end. Our entire existence, which is forever, since we're the children of God and we possess the eternal, incorruptible life of Christ within us, um, our existence is forever, apt forever, and we can't we can't even wrap our minds around that that we are actually going to live forever. Um, the entire time, which is forever, that we're living, we possess an, an ever increasing glory. The entire time, our glory will ever be increasing; will never stop increasing. Um, it's eternal. It's eternal. So that's. That's our, that's our situation. I mean, it, so it is a position of great glory. Being a child of God is a position of great glory. Jesus prayed for that. Um, he, he said, the glory that you've given me, Father, I am giving to them. He's giving us his glory. Um, that's what we have. We have the glory of Christ. Uh, so not a comfortable subject. You know, it's one of those things. It's just like if you say you're righteous. If you say you're righteous, um, it sets religious ears on fire. They're not righteous. There's no one righteous, not even one. Um, yes, that was everybody's situation before the Son of God. You're absolutely right. Whether Jew or Gentile, there was no one righteous, not even one. That's what that scripture is talking about. Um, we are the righteousness of, of Christ in, um, in, in, in Christ. We are, we are the righteousness of God, rather, in Christ, is what scripture says. Um, we are righteous. It sounds arrogant because it's not taught. And they, and, uh, especially now, if you really want to really want to irritate someone, say that we're perfect, because scripture also says that. Hebrews 10, 14, <laughs> by one offering, we've been perfected forever. Um, we also have that. We also have that we've been made perfect, you know, and that's another thing. Oh, how, how, how dare you? Nobody's perfect. The children of God actually are. That's, that's, Jesus is a big deal. It's a big deal what he did. Um, he changed everything. He changed absolutely everything. <laughs> um, we are in Christ. Christ is perfect. Christ is righteous. Um, we are in him. Christ is holy. We are those things too. Scripture refers to us as those things. We are glorified. Christ is glorified. He's seated at the right hand of God. We also likewise are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Um, we're the children of God. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So, uh, so going down here, he says, rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So he's saying, look, we're giving you the, the, the plain truth here. This is the plain truth. This is the ministry of the Spirit. This is how it supersedes the ministry of death. We're presenting that plainly. And by doing that, we're commending ourselves in the sight of God, um, in front of everyone. So then he goes down here and he says, and this is very interesting here, verse 3, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. 
So if, if, remember that we just talked about how there was a veil over the faces of the Israelites. They cannot see the glory of God. To this day, every October, when the Day of Atonement comes, which is Yom Kippur, but it, and I'm not sure what Jewish month that's supposed to fall in. I think it's the month of Nisan, which makes me think of the car manufacturer Nisan. But I think that's when the Day of Atonement falls is in the Jewish month of, month of Nisan, which happens to be the um, what do we have now? The Gregorian calendar, I believe it's called, which is October. And they go to the, uh, the, the what's left of the temple, the, the, the retaining wall that's in Jerusalem. Some people call it the Wailing Wall. But they go there, they migrate into Jerusalem, and they pray for God to send the Messiah because they have rejected Jesus Christ. They have completely and totally rejected him. Their problem from Mount Sinai to 2023 has been unbelief. That has been the the problem of the descendants of Abraham. They have never believed in God. They still don't. They still don't. That's why they're at the Wailing Wall praying for the Messiah to come. So that's talking about the Jews, but then he's just saying here in a general sense, um, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, both Jew and Gentile. And then he goes on here and he says, the God of this age, who is Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So we have some powerful scripture here, but he's saying, look, the devil is actively involved in blinding people, Jew and Gentile. Jews, it's going to be easy. Uh, They've always been rooted in unbelief. But but Gentiles don't have a history with Yahweh. So the devil has to really get in there and um, and blind them specifically from seeing Christ, Uh, not not necessarily from believing in God, which everyone does to some degree. Uh, the Book of Romans says that in the first chapter. Everyone to some degree does believe in God. That's why they hate him, because they do believe in him. Uh, but So it's not really necessarily that he's trying to blind him from that. He's trying to blind him from the gospel, because that's what would save them. Only in Christ is that veil removed, he said in chapter 3. So even if the gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. I keep having these conversations with my wife about our brothers and sisters, maybe, um, you know, uh, Christians, or so they claim, that go go to church. You know, they're kind of in the religious system, okay? They're kind of part of the religious system. They have that strange religious gospel where Jesus doesn't rescue you from anything, uh, but he does give you eternal life. And he is the son of God in that gospel. You know, in the church gospel, they absolutely say Jesus is the son of God. They say that all the time. Uh, but it's almost a different Jesus that, that gets preached there because it's a Jesus who doesn't do anything. He, he doesn't actually do, he doesn't accomplish anything, um, but he is the son of God. So we, we, you know, we keep having these conversations, you know, back and forth. I'm like, is that, is that sufficient? Is that church gospel sufficient? Are these people actually saved by believing in that strange Jesus, that strange Jesus who is the son of God, but doesn't do anything? He doesn't, he doesn't save you from sin. He doesn't save you from death. Death being separation from God. He, he doesn't save you from those things. Um, you're not saved by his life. The resurrection, I think, I don't even know what that does in, in the church gospel. I'm not even sure what the resurrection does. Uh, you're not changed at all. You're still a filthy sinner with a wicked, depraved heart, uh, the sinful nature. I, so, so we, you know, we, we've been having that conversation back and forth, and I, I can... We're, I'm like undecided on it, and it doesn't matter. You know, I, I can come to an opinion, but it doesn't mean that that's true. Only God knows the answer to that. Um, but it's a veiled gospel, isn't it? I mean, it's 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 concealing the Son of God. It's it's belittling the Son of God, and um, and nobody seems to get that. And that's kind of what I'm connecting here when he says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. When we talk about Jesus, we talk about the authentic gospel to these people who are so caught in this church whatever it is, whether it's legalism or faith plus works or whatever it is, um, they can't really understand it. And that's, that's what I, I wonder. They get angry or they, they it just, it just doesn't, they, they don't really get it. And I, and that's, that's where I start to wonder, I'm like, is it because it's veiled to them? And is it because they're perishing? And is, is that what's happening here? They think they're, they think, they think that they've, they're, they're, I don't know what the term would be. You know, they, they think that they've, they've, they're on the straight and narrow. I'm not sure if that's the right term, but the, the, but they think you, you guys kind of get what I'm saying. They they think that, but that's not really the case because they're actually have stumbled over the stumbling block. They've missed the Son of God, and the gospel's actually veiled to them. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm like I said, it's it's something I'm I've been thinking a lot about recently. I've been thinking a lot about it because how how do we do that? You know, when 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 the gospel is what it is, and we we know what it is. Um, you guys, you guys. I mean, we're we're. We talk about this almost every day. You know, I mean, we all we all are very familiar with the gospel, Jesus Christ, uh, salvation. 
Jesus literally translates as Yahweh's salvation. The gospel is a person. His name is Jesus. And it is. It is. Um, we, we talk about that all the time. But, but, but when we, you know, I don't know, like I said, I'm, I'm still, I'm still kicking that around. I'm still kicking that around. It's like, you know, how could you know that and then try to mix in the Old Testament? Like, so, but not, not, you know, obviously we keep the Old Testament, you know, obviously not, I don't mean like throw it away, but I mean, I, how could you know Jesus, know, know the gospel and then go and say, oh, we need to be like Noah. We need to be like Abraham. We need to be like David. Um, that, that's hard for me to process. That's hard for me to process that. It could just be ignorance. You know, it's just, they just don't know any better. And it's just, that's how they're being taught. It, it could be that, but, but I wonder, I wonder if that's, it's actually a veiled mind. I start to wonder that. So um, anyway, uh, that's just my thoughts on it. So we, we have the God of this age who's blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Adam was created in God's image. He was created in God's image, okay? Jesus is actually that image, is the image of God. Um, Adam was created as a model of God. Jesus is actually God. He is the true image of God. Uh, scripture says that here. It also says it in Colossians, that the Son is the image of the invisible God. If God were visible, God is spirit, and he is visible to spirit. Um, we're not spirit. We're, we're still, you know, we're still in these, these bodies, so he's not visible to us necessarily. Um, but if he were, he would look like Jesus Christ because Jesus is the image of God. He's the son of God. Um, he's, he's God in the flesh. So that's just cool scripture there. Um, he goes down here and he says, um, for what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus sake. And this is some excellent scripture here. I, I, um, I love this part. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So first famous line of God in the entire Bible is let there be light. God who said, let light shine out of darkness. God says this, let light shine out of darkness. That same light, the same light that brought life to this world, which gets paralleled in the opening of the gospel of John with the coming of the son of God in him was light, um, life and that life was the light of all mankind now shines within our hearts. Um, our new hearts not, not, not the previous one. Our new hearts has the, the very light of God. The very first thing that he ever said, let there be light. Now we carry the light of God around within us, who is the son of God. It's, it's interesting because we have, we have Christ in our hearts. I mean, that's, 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 the, um, that's what we teach and that's true. And that's what scripture says. Um, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And he is the light from the beginning. Um, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And that's what we have. Um, God's light now shines within our hearts. How cool is that? That's what's so awesome about the New Testament, is it's one, it's, it's one description of the children of God after another. Um, here we've just been told we have ever-increasing glory. Um, we, we have the ministry of the Spirit. Uh, we have the ministry that gives righteousness, that brings righteousness. Now it's saying now we have the very light of God shining within our hearts. Um, and, and he actually goes on here, he says, um, the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Going back to what we talked about, I think it was last week, the only way to know God is through the Son of God. Uh, there's no knowing God without the Son of God. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. We know God because we know his Son. Anyone who knows me, what does Jesus say? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. From now on, you have seen him and you do know him. We know our Father. Uh, the reason I say that is because we have thousands upon thousands of books that attempt to teach us how to know God. We do not need a book to teach us how to know God. We know our Father. What an absurd notion that we, his children, do not know him, our Father. What an absurd, absurd notion. Of course we know him. Um, we do not need to, to have all these different devotionals. Well, this is, this is how you know God, and you can do this to get to know God better, and all these different things. We know, we know our dad. We, we know him, and he knows us. Uh, we also know our older brother, Jesus. We don't, we don't need that. That's, that's, that's so silly, especially since the majority of it's based out of the Old Testament, whenever they do that. So that's why I constantly am bringing that up. And then he goes down here in verse 7, and this is something that gets quoted quite a bit, and it took me a long time to understand this. But we have this treasure, this light of God, everything that's been sp spoken about, the unveiled faces, the ever-increasing glory. We have this treasure, he says, in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. It took me a while to understand what that meant. But here's what I think. The jars of clay is referring to these physical bodies. 
so interesting. I'm actually studying this right now, uh, creation. So interesting. We, we so often say that um, Adam was formed from the dust of the earth. The Hebrew word, have you ever tried to make anything out of dust? Um, the, he, the Hebrew word is actually clay, and it, it can mean dust as well, but it, it, the, the word is really clay. Uh, you, you can make things out of clay. I don't know, if you gather dust up, <laughs> you, can make a, you can make a big hairball, but you, you can't really make a person out of it. And I, I think that, you know, of course God could. He could, he could make somebody out of dust. Uh, he absolutely could do that, but I think clay is, is more accurate. And I think that's what Paul's saying here. He actually molded Adam out of clay, breathed into him a spirit, and that's what turned turned his clay form, the pottery, into uh, flesh and blood, was the receiving of this, of this spirit from God. But, uh, so that's what, that's what he's, I think he's saying here. He's saying, look, we have all these things in jars of clay. This, this brings glory to God uh, by the fact that he's made us new in these physical forms in this world. This brings glory to God. This is, we are walking testaments of the defeat of the God of this world, who is the devil. We are walking testimonies of that. We've already been regenerated. A new creation is coming. We're the first fruits of the new creation. We, the children of God, we're already here. We're, we're here now. Um, it, we're basically, I think when the devil sees us, the children of God, we are like a giant hourglass. You know, like in um, The Wizard of Oz, I think, was one of those where the witch had that big hourglass. And I, I don't remember what she was going to do, like kill everybody or something when the sand ran out. Um, that's us to the devil. We're, we're, that, we're, that giant, um, we're that giant hourglass. His time is, is slipping away because we're already here. The new creation has come. Watch out, Satan, because your doom, the clock is ticking. It's ticking now. You, and that's why you have in Revelation when he gets thrown to earth in chapter 12. It says, um, but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has come to you in great anger, knowing his time is short. And then he turns around and he declares war on anyone who holds fast their testimony about Jesus. Uh, he does it. He declares war on the children of God because he knows he's running out of time so quickly, uh, so, so quickly now, because we are here. Jesus has won. The cross happened. Here we are, the product of that. And um, it we're testimonies. We're walking testimonies. So we're the jars of clay that have been regenerated, but we still have these outward forms, the clay. So uh, going on here, um, I'm going to skip a little bit of this. This is we're still in first, uh, second Corinthians. I'm going to screw that up nonstop here. Apparently, we're in second Corinthians chapter four. Uh, something I wanted to point out briefly is this little bit here. This is in uh, verse thirteen. It says, it is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. That is a quote of Psalms 116. It is written, I have believed, therefore I have spoken. And then he says on here, he says, since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore we speak. This is a little off subject, but um, the reason that I wanted to bring this up is because scripture mentions about 130 times that to be saved one must believe in Jesus Christ. That's, that's how you're saved. You're believing in, in the Son of God. It mentions one time saying that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, it's in Romans chapter 10, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Unfortunately, we have 130 mentions of believing in the Son of God for salvation. We have one mention that, has, that says if you confess with your mouth, and that's the one we've latched onto. And then that's where the sinner's prayer has been created, and we've, we've gone all these bad directions with it. Well, you have to acknowledge Jesus is Lord, and then we have different ways you have to say this now. And um, even that verse, though, I think that's Romans 10. It's either Romans 10, 10, or 10, 14 that says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But even that verse says, if you believe in your heart, um, believing in the Son of God is what saves you. You, you, can, you can believe in Jesus and never say a word and, 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 and still be saved. And I know that it says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you will do that. You will do that. You could believe in the Son of God, believe that Jesus is, is who he says he is. That's going to flow now. You're going to be saying, you're going to be proclaiming the Messiah all the time. And it doesn't have to be in a specific word pattern. <laughs> that's going to happen. And that's actually what 2 Corinthians 4 is saying. Um, that's actually what that's saying. We believed, therefore we have spoken. We have that word of faith. We believed first, therefore we have spoken. Um, we do that all the time. We, we, are, we are declaring that Jesus is Lord all the time. This is not a singular action for salvation. This is something we just do because we are the children of God. We are the children of God because Jesus is Lord and because he was successful. Well, it was because of what he did, bringing about that reconciliation, that we are born of, of his spirit and we are the children of God. So we are talking about that all the time. It's not a 
you have to do that first. And if you don't say Jesus is Lord, then you're not saved. It is not that. It has never been that. It is believing in the Son of God. That can happen. That is a wordless thing that happens within your heart. Um, it happens. You, you process that thought. Sometimes it's not even a... You know how, you, of course, we know how thinking works. You know, you can you can talk to yourself inside your head. However, we know how it works. We could never probably explain how that is. Um, but we know that that's possible because we all think. Um, when it comes to believing, so you're believing that Jesus is the Son of God. You're believing that. Um, that can be wordless. That can be a subconscious thing. You just realized it. You, ju- you just, I'm like, oh my gosh, I get it. I get it. And you see the Son of God. You know, you, you, you have that moment where you see Jesus and you're like, you, you're really him. You're really him. You believe that. At that very moment, this Holy Spirit came to rest upon you. Um, it does not, you didn't have to say anything. There doesn't have to be a specific thought pattern. You believe Jesus was who he said he was. That's salvation. Um, that's, that's salvation. Not, uh, the, the sinner's prayer is fine if you are believing. Um, you know, you know, those things we see in the tracks, the Romans road to salvation. I, I personally dislike it because I think it takes the focus off the fact that you're believing in Jesus for salvation. Um, that's, that's salvation. It doesn't matter what you said. Um, it's, it's, it's about, did you believe in the Son of God? So that's why I dislike the Romans road to salvation. I dislike those, those printed sinner's prayers. Uh, not that they're not effective. If you, if you believed that and you said this, that's great. Then you're saved. But you have to believe. And I think that the the, the sinner's prayer, unfortunately, is now seen as salvation. Oh, you said this, so you're saved. Oh, well, repeat after me, okay? And then you, you repeat this prayer. Okay, well, now if you repeated this prayer, you're saved. No, you're not. Not unless you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you said that prayer, then you are saved. But you have to believe that. And, that's, and I think that the sinner's prayer takes the focus off of that. It takes the focus off of faith, puts it on you. Just say this prayer and you're good to go. Um... That's where I fear because I can tell you guys, and this is my this is my experience, uh, personal. So it doesn't mean this is everybody's experience. It certainly is not everybody's experience. Um, I said the sinner's prayer like five million times throughout my Christian career, as I call it, my church career. I said the sinner's prayer more times than I ever could count, trying to make something happen. Maybe this is the time. Maybe it's going to work this time. Maybe it's going to stick this time. Um, I, I did it over and over and over and over and over again, trying to make something happen all while ignoring the Son of God, all while ignoring Jesus. That's why I was never saved um, by, by, by reciting this. I was never saved by saying the sinner's prayer because I didn't believe. I didn't believe in Jesus. I believed in if I said this prayer, then somehow I'm saved. And that's why I dislike it, because I think it produces false conversions. I also think it produces um, false conversions in the sense, okay, so somebody says this, all right? They go to church camp, they go to church, Sunday school, however, whenever this gets presented to them, they say this prayer. Then... They, they move, you know, the pastor says, okay, now if you just repeated this prayer, you're saved. Okay, so now I'm saved, the person says, who just said this prayer. Um, but they never believed in Jesus. So now they're, they could go their whole life by saying, oh, yeah, I'm saved because, you know, back at uh, whenever this was, I, you know, I, I, I gave my life to the Lord or however we're going to say it. But, but if you never believed, then it didn't do anything. And that's what I fear because... We used to have these crusades at our churches where it would be like these evangelism crusades. And I'm sure you guys have all been uh, through that. We have these evangelism crusades and we'd say, oh, well, 50 souls gave themselves to the Lord. And yeah, but did anybody believe in Jesus? I mean, 50 people said the prayer. Uh, out of the 50 people, did did seven of them, did five of them uh, believe believe in Jesus? That, that's that's my fear with that. This is all just, this is my opinion, my take on it. But that, that's my fear with that because um, I was one of those people. We used to have balloons on the stage. It would represent all the all the people that, uh, oh, well, these all balloons all represent someone who gave their life to Christ. I'm like, I was a balloon on the stage, and I did not give my life to Christ. I said the sinner's prayer. If the, if the balloons represent people who said the sinner's prayer, then fine. But I, I don't. I, so that, that's all I'm saying about that. I didn't mean to go on a huge tangent. I feel like it can dodge the Son of God. I feel like it does that. That That's my worry with that prayer. Because based on personal experience, I feel like it's a workaround almost for believing in Christ. That's why I don't use it. That's why I dislike it. And that's why whenever I'm talking about the gospel, it's always believe in the Son of God. It's never, well, you have to, you know, here's a few lines you can recite and then you're good to go. No, don't don't recite the lines. Like as far as my, my you know, as, as far as if, if, if I were the one teaching it, I would never say like, recite this or say this. No, 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 no. Believe in Jesus. That's that's the gospel. So those are my opinions on it. I, I think I, I, you know, there's a lot that you can tell as I'm talking. There's personal bad experience interwoven with that. So uh, please take that into account that, you know, obviously I'm 
a little I'm a little biased on this, so please take that into account and and decide for yourselves if if the sinner's prayer is valuable or not. You know, if that's something you want to use or not. Um, so going down here a little bit, I wanted to jump. Um, uh, you know what? I think we'll do this. To, I think we'll do the next part of this tomorrow because the, the next part that talks about the ministry. Um, the Ministry of Reconciliation and how we're Christ's ambassadors, that's really big. So I think we'll do that tomorrow because I want to have time to get to your comments because I saw there was a lot of them. So let me scroll up to the top here. Um, okay, so by Grace New Covenant says, Is the veil also a symbol for us Gentiles being led to Christ before the Jews' hearts is softened again so that they're enlightened to be able to see Jesus Christ as the Messiah? Well, it could be because... Certainly in Romans, uh, what is it? Is it chapter 10? Is it chapter 10? Or it's, it's the later chapters of Romans talk about that the Gentiles were grafted in. Uh, they were grafted in with, with God, essentially, to make the Jews envious. So it, it, it certainly could be that uh, by grace and covenant. I think that's an excellent observation. So yes, um, the Gentiles... The whole reason, the mystery of Christ, that the Gentiles were now um, co-heirs with Israel and, and all of that that we see, um, I think that's Ephesians that says that, um, the point of the Gentiles being brought in was absolutely to make Israel jealous. So that's a good point, and it, it very much could be that. Um, and, then, and then the idea, hopefully, would be that the Israelites, the, the Jewish descendants of Abraham, would see the Gentiles being regenerated, born again, the children of God emerging in the Gentiles. They would be jealous, they'd be envious, and they would actually pay attention to Jesus. I think that was the idea there. Um, I'm not sure that they did it. I think there, there were scattered ones that did, um, but I'm not sure that, you know, really the, the, the bulk of the people did do that. Um, up north says, as uncomfortable as it is, our glory is the biggest honor we will ever receive, at least here on earth. Yeah, you know, that's the thing. And it's, it's, we kind of do feel shy with saying that I'm, I'm not now, I'm, you know, before I, I gotta be careful how I say this, but I think this is, let me, let me put some framework around this. Jeremiah's opinion, Jeremiah's opinion, because I'm going to say something that could, could be, offensive. So I'm going to say it. It's just, just an opinion, just a thought, not prescribing this to any particular person. But I think saying that we're sinners, oh, we're, just, we're sinners, we're the chief of sinners, whatever. Um, I think that's actually false humility to say that. And it's, it's, first of all, it's wrong. We're never referred to as sinners in the New Testament. But I think doing that or saying like nobody's perfect or, you know, trying to do things like you know, like that to kind of negate who we've really been made in Christ, kind of um, these these statements that are just absolute enemies of the cross, saying you know that we're sinners, the children of God are sinners. I see that as false humility. I do. I'm like, you're not. You know, you're glorified, and that se that seems arrogant to say that. It seems wrong to say you're righteous and you're glorified. That's only because there's heaps and piles of bad teachings that have come before us that have said the opposite. But if we just go back to the pages of Scripture, it says all those things about us. It says we're sanctified, justified, glorified. We've been made holy. We're saints. Saints mean holy people. That's, that's us. That's the children of God. So, so um, yeah, it is. You know, we, we have been glorified. We have been made the children of God. It can be uncomfortable, especially with all the legalistic ears that hear that. But um, look, I, what I would need, here's what I would need. I would need scripture that tells me that I'm a sinner with a sinful nature in order for me to say that. Because I can't find that. But I can find scripture that says that I'm justified and glorified and I'm a child of God. I can find that. So I'm going to go with that. And that's just, that's just, that's it. I'm just going to go with that. I, I think that that glorifies God, that glorifies Jesus Christ by saying that. Look what he's done. Look what he's done with us. You know, look, look at all these things that he's done to us. He, look, look, look who we've been made in Christ. Um, that glorifies God. I think saying we're sinners with sinful natures and we're these disgusting, rotten people, I think that's almost blasphemous to say that. That's, that's an enemy of the cross to say those things. The scripture never says that about the children of God. You're speaking about God's kids when you say that. You know that, That's what I'd be worried about. I'm like, I'm, I'm calling God's kids sinners and I'm calling them, dis, you know, oh, they're, they're vile, they have sinful natures, they have wicked hearts. Um, God's children? That's, that's who we're talking about because we have to also keep in mind when we're saying that Jesus is the firstborn of God's children. He's the firstborn son. Um, he's not ashamed. It says, Hebrews chapter 2, speaking about Jesus, speaking about our Father, it says this. It says, both he who sanctifies, that's Jesus, and those who are sanctified, that's us, are from one Father, that's God. 
For this reason, it says, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He's not. Why? Because we have been made like him. He's not ashamed. We're from the same father that he's from. We're in the same family. Uh, we're, we're younger. He's our, he's our older brother. We're younger than him, but we're, we're from the same father. Uh, he's not ashamed of us. He, he's not ashamed of us. In fact, he declares our name. Uh, the next part of that says, I will declare your name um, at, um, in, in the assembly of God. I will proclaim the name of my brothers and sisters. I'm not quoting it exactly right. Um, he actually says, I'm sorry. And then he says, in the assembly, I will sing your praises. He's talking about us. Jesus isn't ashamed of us. So we shouldn't be ashamed of us. Uh, we shouldn't. We should just latch on to everything the New Testament says about who we are and shout it from the rooftops, honestly. You get a lot of shellac from it, though. You'll absolutely get a lot of shellac from the, um, from the religious crowd. Uh, uh, sad for used to know they stumbled. Um, we can only pray for them. My Jewish friends do not want to hear anything about Jesus. Breaks my heart. They're, they're rooted in unbelief. Um, if you, if, if we go to, um, the chap, the last couple chapters of Romans, it describes the state of the Jews and, um, unbelief has always been their problem from Exodus 20, when they received the 10 commandments to 2023, all the way up to present day. It has always been unbelief. They have never believed in God. That has always been their problem. Uh, I, you know, but that's, that's why, uh, that's, again, that's why the Gentiles were brought in. We were talking about that a little bit, a little while ago, is because the Jews, the people of God, rejected God. You have in the Gospels, I don't remember exactly where this is, but you have the parable of the wedding feast, or not the wedding feast, um, the, there's a king giving a banquet, something Jesus tells a story, but the king giving a banquet, and he invites his people, his the people of his kingdom, to the banquet. He prepares this big banquet. He invites them, and not a single one shows up. So then he says, go out to the streets, go out to the country lands, find anyone at all, and invite them to the banquet. And it's a, it's a metaphor, I believe. The way I interpret that is Jews and Gentiles. You have God prepares this big glory, glory but essentially, for the Jews, for his chosen people, and not a single one of them will show up. But so then he goes out to, abs- to anyone, anyone at all, and I kind of see that as the gospel was given first to the Jews. That happens in the book of Acts. It's rejected. And some, some believe, but it, largely it's, it's rejected. But there are Jews who do believe. But then the gospel, so uh, Paul actually says something like this. He says, I had to preach the gospel to you first, but since you didn't consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, I'm now going to turn to the Gentiles. And then the gospel goes out to the entire world at that point. And go find anyone at all who will believe and bring them in. Bring them in. So, absolutely. Um, by Grace New Covenant says it's only it's only showing some aspects of Jesus Christ. It's simply not taught correctly, not even regarded regarding the Old Testament, but lots of errors and man made traditions. Yeah, we have quite quite a few of those. Uh, quite a few of those. We have a watered down Jesus that's taught in our in our gospel teachings. A very watered down Jesus. We like Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, because that's the more hardline Jewish gospel. So we like that one. We don't like the Gospel of John. That one hardly gets any airtime. We don't like that one. Or if it does, it's around Christmas. Usually, when John will show up, it'll be around Christmas. You'll have the um, the in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. You'll have all that because they'll talk about the coming of the Christ. So you have John used a lot around Christmas. The thing about John is it's 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 so different, right? Um, the Sermon on the Mount is not in the Gospel of John, for one thing. Um, there's not a single parable in the Gospel of John. Not not even one. Not a single parable in the entire Gospel. It's all about Jesus is the Son of God, and by believing in him, you are saved. That's the entire theme. The entire uh, Gospel of John spins around that. It's believed that the reason that John is so different is it's believed. It's believed that uh, Matthew was written by Matthew, who was a disciple of Jesus, and this was really to Jews. This is a Jewish gospel. It's written to Jews. That's why you start with the genealogy, proving that Jesus is the Messiah. That's why you have the Sermon on the Mount. That's why you have these hardline Jewish teachings about the law. It's because this is really for a Jewish audience. It's believed that Mark was written for a Roman audience who liked the facts. That's why Mark is the action-packed gospel. We skip, Mark skips everything. He just gets to the highlights. There's hardly any talk. There's hardly any conversation. It's all just events, and it's short. It's the shortest gospel. Um, it's believed that Luke was written to Greeks, the philosophers who enjoyed every little detail. So that's why Luke is an all-encompassing. He's got every, every little bit in there. But finally, it's believed that John was written to Christians, to the children of God. And um, it's, it's more of an evangelistic gospel. And it's, this is who Jesus is. Jesus is the son of God. Believe in him and you're saved. And that's why John teaches about um, being born again, things like that that don't show up in the other gospels. He teaches about what, what, what does Jesus do? Who is this son of God? What exactly is his, his ministry? Um, you have all the I am statements that are in the gospel of John that are not in the other three. So it's, it's really more of a picture of Christ. 
uh, but it's not liked as much. It just isn't liked as much because the Jesus in the Gospel of John isn't, I, I think he's not the one that that really would support these more legalistic teachings that you see in, in um you know, in the in our churches, these more man-made traditions. It's hard to fit the Jesus, the Son of God Jesus, into those. So that, that's my opinion on it. Um, uh, 7 a.m., I think, I'm say, if I'm saying that right, says Jesus is the only way. Uh, by Grace New Covenant says, yes, we can always pray for people. Amen. Absolutely. Yes, clay is definitely more applicable. I think so. I think so. It's the same word. Dust and clay are the same word in Hebrew, but... Um, and like I said, you ever try to make anything out of dust? I don't think that paints a very um, imaginable picture, saying, you know, Adam was formed out of the dust of the earth. We can say it because that's what scripture says, but we also could say clay because that's really, it's the same word and it makes more sense. Um, up north says Revelation 12 is a good word picture. Yes. Uh, yeah. We did a video on that not, not too long ago. We're talking about Revelation 12. Um, it's only believe. Yes, it is. It's only believe in Jesus. Um I'm just scrolling down here a little bit. Uh, you are saved be um, because we believe. Yes, you are saved by believing in, that Jesus is the Son of God. That's that's salvation. Um, it's believing in the Son, uh, believing in Jesus. Not really, not really a formula other than believing in Christ. I think that 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 that's that's it. Whether or not you acknowledge anything, um, that's that's not really prescribed. It's not really prescribed in in, in the Gospels. It, it isn't, and it's and or or in the epistles. Whether or not you you actually say anything or how that works, it's it's you saw you you saw Jesus. You, you know you saw him for who he is. Not you actually laid your physical eyes on him, but you you, you know you 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 recognize that that he he is who he says he is. Um, you you recognize that he is the Son of God. That's who he says he is, and and you believe that. However, that goes for you. I think that's going to vary. However, that however that happens, it's, this could be something. Here, here's another thing, uh, and I know we're almost out of time, so I'll say this very very quickly. But that can happen over a period of time too. It's so essentially when you have you have a lot of verses in the New Testament talk about continuing in the faith, continuing in what you've heard, um, because believing in something for some people it's instantaneously. You you hear about Jesus and you're like, okay, you know, and, and there you go. The Holy Spirit comes to rest upon you. Other people are a little bit more skeptical. They might have some hurt in their life that's going to make believing in anyone a little bit more difficult for them. So they're exposed to the gospel message over a period of time. They're continuing in what they heard. And at some point during that exposure, they believe. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They've, they've heard the stories about him over and over. They've heard about him, and they said, you know what? I believe in him. The second that that happens, they don't. They, maybe they don't say it, maybe they think it, maybe it's subconscious. The second that that happens, that they believe, um, the Holy Spirit comes to rest upon that person. So either way, the same result. Some people are fast with it. Some people are, it's easy for them to believe. Other people, not so much. Uh, but either way, either way, it's the same. It's believing in the Son of God. It's the same thing. So, and I think God is patient too. You know, that's, that's another thing. I think I think that God is very patient with people who, have had have had pain in their lives. Anything that's going to make it difficult for them to believe, um, I think he's very patient with them, and he works exactly with them right where they're at. And I don't think I don't think he's wringing his hands either. You know, I don't think he's like, oh man, I really got to get this person to believe. I really got to. No, no, he's 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 got it under control. You know, he's he's gonna he's gonna the Holy Spirit's gonna evangelize to that person exactly at a pace that they're gonna be able to to accept. He's a good father. He's a good father. Um, he's he's gonna do that. So, um, all right. Then. Okay. Well, um, thanks so much, guys. I, re I really appreciate you being here. Thanks for the conversation. Um, but, uh, yeah, so those are my thoughts on second Corinthians. I think that was three and a little bit of four. And tomorrow I want to finish this up because this talks a lot about the ministry of reconciliation, which is, um, a whole thing, a whole thing, how we're Christ's ambassadors and it's just really cool scripture. So we will get that tomorrow. Um, thank you guys. Yes. Thanks for the fellowship. Thank you for the fellowship. Um, I really appreciate you guys. And I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good day. Bye.